So we are on uh, chapter 10, section six, and we're going into the halogens. So what is a halogen? Well, let's look at our periodic table. So this is kind of fun, isn't it? So as we look at our periodic table here, and we go across to um, the very far right, you'll see where the halogens are. They're labeled here, halogens here um, in the red. We'll, we'll be talking about uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And acetine um, is a, for treatment, radiation treatment. So we're going to actually talk about that in a different chapter here. So, but basically we have fluorine here looking with a toothpaste on it, chlorine with a swimming pool, fire extinguisher, so for bromine, iodine with the iodine ink, you know, so these four, they're very reactive. So in fact, they do not even, in their natural state, they are ionic, so they're already, always ready to react. So the halogens um, can will react with most of the metals, you know. In fact, they react with most of, most of the elements on the chart, um, besides the noble gases, they react with them um, very easily. So let's go kind of begin here. So the halogens are in group 17, and they are too reactive to be found um, in their natural state. And so um, you can see chlorine and bromine and iodine are, find, are, are found as um, uh, ions. So we have a, a chlorine ion, a bromine ion, and an iodine um, ion. So, and in the seawater, um, they're found in seawater, and fluorine is found in the minerals of uh, fluorospar, which is calcium fluoride, and crit uh, critolite, which is sodium. In the midst of all this, um, they're also found in, or actually chlorine is found in rock salts and salt mines, and iodine is obtained from the impurities of sodium iodate, in this picture, and sodium nitrate, which is um, saltpeter. So, and the chlorine ion is a primary um, anion found in cellular fluid. So chloride ion is in our body, in our cells. So it's a very important halogen too, especially in dealing with our cells in our bodies. So the properties, um, these are the most reactive of the nonmetals and all are highly reactive and highly to toxic. And the toxicity decreases down the group from fluorine to iodine. So if you take fluorine and look at your picture here, and from fluorine all the way down to iodine, the toxicity will reduce, and you'll we'll see that in the chart later on. So um, let's go down here to the picture. So uh, properties, well, let's look at this table, and we'll tell uh, quite a bit of the properties here and going over them. So let's start with, we'll look and we have um, chlorine, and these are chlorine gas, and chlorine gas is a kind of this yellow, green yellow gas here, and we have the gas of iodine here. That gas too is a purplish, dark gray, solid metallic luster. Um, in when I mean, you think of iodine, but this is the gas state, which is more of a purplish, purplish color, purple vapor has a purple vapor, and um, turns in when it turns into liquid, it gets dark. And then bromine is this dark um, brown. Um, this is, the, the, of course, the vapor of it. But if you look at the liquid, which um, comes in the liquid form at room temperature, it's the same dark red brown liquid color as the gas is too. So let's look at this table here. So fluorine formula is F2 for fluorine. It melts at negative 223 degrees, boiling part negative 187 degrees centigrade. Um, and of course, this pale yellow gas, um, it also is very, um, you know, in, in the midst of this, it's, it's very reactive. So this is, there isn't a picture of fluorine, fluorine here, but it's the most reactive of all the elements in the periodic uh, table. And chlorine, of course, is uh, Cl2, negative um, 102 degrees centigrade, negative 35 boiling point. That's the melting point and boiling point. And this yellow green ga gra uh, gas is also very choking. Have you ever 
choked on when you're in the swimming pool with too much chlorine. So you know what chlorine smells like. And it's uh, denser than air. The bromine, uh, negative seven degrees melting point uh, centigrade and 59 degrees centigrade. So it, it um, at room temperature or such, it's a, it's a liquid. It's a brown, red brown liquid. But it can, when it forms gas, it looks like that. So um, bromine, anything else? It, um, basically, bromine um, has a similar irritating odor as chlorine and it attacks the skin. So let's see if you put it on your skin, it's going to have um, um, slow burns on your skin. It's a very toxic vapor and very corrosive. That's bromine. Iodine, of course, is a dark gray solid. So it, it's in a solid form. Um, it comes basically as this metallic luster. It's sublime, so usually iodine goes from a gas. Sublime means it goes from a gas directly to a solid, skipping the liquid state in this form. So, and uh, it's not soluble in water unless iodine is present, and iodine also reacts um, um, to starch. So have you ever had a test, you know, maybe in chemistry or something where you wanted to test if something had starch in it? You just add iodine and it will turn this purplish color showing up as a starch. So it's a way you can detect starches, one thing of iodine. So um, as we said, these are all, um, halogens are the most reactive of non-metals and um, toxic and also fluorine is the most reactive of any element, any element. Um, so that'd be a test question. Fluorine is the most reactive element of all of the elements on the periodic table. So preparation. So now we're gonna talk about how um, chlor uh, fluorine is prepared. And they do this by passing electric current through it. So they call this electrolyzing. And as they're electrolyzing it, um, they take, you know, fluorospar, which is calcium fluoride is one way. Um, fluorine, I should say. I don't want to say, I keep saying fluoride, but fluorine. Um, and this, and they basically take take this as going through this electric current. And um, it's like a couple steps here. First step, second step. Um, taking this step, going on to the fluorospar, onto um, hydrogen and fluorine. And so we have fluorine. Chlorine is similarly prepared. Um, it is very electronegative. That means very reactive, elect electronegative. So um, the electrolysis goes through a salt solution like brine or um, seawater or molten rock salt. And as you put this through, you have sodium chloride. You recognize sodium chloride, which is salt and electric currents pass through and you get um, salt, you get um, sodium, liquid sodium, and um, um, chlorine. So the element chlorine. Several billion pounds of chlorine are produced in the United States each year. That's a lot of uh, chlorine produced, making it one of the most important chemicals in production. So many chemicals, or so many um, pounds of chlorine. So let's... I can get to the next page. <clears throat> Bromine and iodine are off, uh, often produced commercially by bubbling chlorine through seawater or brine. And so here's the equation for that. See how we have now as you have bromine and chlorine, but basically as bubbling through borone, um, bromine, we end up getting to get through by going through this bubbling process. Elemental iodine may also be prepared from sodium iodate ore. So you can take this iodate ore and um, sometimes seaweed. Seaweed is a really good source of iodine. You wouldn't think it is. So if you're eating seaweed, you're probably getting your iodine. And I don't, most people don't eat seaweed uh, on a daily basis though. So, <clears throat> um, in the laboratory, these halides, except for fluorine, may be prepared from their alkali metal, metal halide salts. So basically taking these salts um, and uh, in concentration under certain temperatures and such, and you will get um, 
be able to um, prepare uh, in the laboratory, prepare these, um, and these are some of the equations down here, as you see, through um, the salts, especially with um, um, magnesium salts. So, so we have solids. Chlorine may also be produced in the laboratory and scale by reacting concentrated with hydrochloric acid. So, and manganese. So here we have the hydrochloric um, acid and manganese producing as you go through these. You want to basically get um, the chlorine on its own and to be able to bring chlorine. So here we have magnesium and chlorine. So um, those are just some ways <clears throat> of preparation. Now let's get into some of the uses, which will be, um, there's a lot of uses with um, all of these, well, especially fluorine and um, chlorine. So um, the uses of fluorine. Okay, first use we have big use is dental hygiene. So there's no pictures here. So for the dental hygiene, one of the well-known known uses of fluorine when you think of um, Fluorine, you think of fluoride, right? That, and that with your teeth. So um, very important. There's and also adding fluorine, a lot of people have added fluorine to drinking water to help, you know, and that midst to uh, um, be useful in the enamel, you know, of um, hydro, um, hydropatite right here, hydropatite calcium and um, OH, this is phosphate. This, this hole here is actually used in the midst. This is strong, hard, um, <clears throat> and very susceptible for decay. This is in our enamel. So, fluoridation is useful because tooth enamel is composed of an insoluble phosphate, such as this. And this substance is strong and hard, but is susceptible to decay because the OH ions you know, um, hydroxide ions are easily dissolved by acid. However, this they are replaced by fluorine. So basically replacing these ions by the flora, fluorine ions, you get a substance called fluoropatite. And here's the substance here. See how this, okay, if you look here, you see up here, um, the OH now is replaced by fluorine. So fluoropatite is harder and it's, um, much more resistant to decay on your teeth. So basically the fluorine, uh, fluoride ion is just actually brought in and replaced, comes in and combines there and replaces that and causes uh, teeth to be stronger, um, the enamel on our teeth. And fluoride ion is also added to drinking water in very small quantities because it can be very toxic, like I said before, one part per million. So if you get too much fluoride, you could be actually poisoned. So you have, very, have to be very careful of the amount of fluoride that you get. And it also is put in the diet of children um, for their bodies to produce you know, their teeth um, enam enamel mainly. Okay, and sometimes the dentist gives you fluoride, right? Fluoride um, treatment to your teeth, and this helps to um, strengthen. A lot of people don't like to put, take a lot of fluoride because um, fluoride can, like you said, in the long run, um, be um, very, very toxic. So, fluorides that are used in toothpastes include sodium fluoride, um, uh, tin fluoride, or let's see the other one here. <clears throat> Stannous fluoride, that's right. Sodium monolucus or whatever, sodium fluoride. So, so very important for your teeth. So now let's go on to another thing with fluorides are refrigerants. So fluorine is used to manufacture refrigerants um, for air conditioners and refrigerators and freezers and heat pumps. Um, to, heat pumps remove heat from the substance to cool it down. So this is very important. Until 1990, most Freon refrigerants, um, you know, were mostly used. So with um, carbon, uh, carbon fluoride and chlorine, um, we call these CFCs. CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons, right? So 
Chloral Forbo Climbs or CFCs. It's very important because the CFCs are now another. Now they want basically want to, wanted them to be banned. You know, and we we talk about CFC, uh, CFCs, and um, again the CFCs um, banned due to um, you know the environment environmental control. So, but um, so Freon twelve. Um, was used in automobile air conditioners. Freon 21 um, was in commercial air conditioning in 1930s. In the 1930s, they were first introduced and they were very efficient and non-toxic and non-corrosive and, in corrosive and inflammable. So, of course, um, they thought, you know, this is perfect. Before, we didn't have refrigeration. I mean, this is important because we couldn't put things in the refrigerator and food would not last very long. And so they'd have to use ice boxes instead. But now with Freons, they, we could refrigerate. So um, despite the advantages of Freons, um, they were banned in 1990s by the Montreal Protocol. Remember we talked about, about the ozone layer after they were accused of harming the Earth's ozone layer. Mm -hmm. So now we know um, not it's, it's not as drastic as it was, but these CFCs, um, along with chlorine, were um, one of the one of the chemicals that were banned with the freons. So, and they were initially replaced by R134A, C2H2F4, which is now now used in automobiles, refrigerators, and air conditioners. So, and then this refrigerant, too, was restricted by the 1997 Kaito Protocol on global warming. And so it's a problem there. So we still have problems, especially with refrigerants at this time. You know, so on to plastics. Okay, the third, we went over the dental and then we went over refrigerants. Now we're going over plastics. Um, another important use of fluorine is in the manufacture of a PTFE or polytetrafluoroethylene. So here we go, polytetrafluoroethylene. And um, the, these um, plastics um, are uh, very um, used for very much for electrical um, insulators and high temperature plastics and cookware, um, non lubricated valves and bearings, all these things um, are in this group um, of plastics, right? Um, On to very interesting the um, perfluorocarbons. When you think of carbons, you think of what? I always think of carbons, I think of organic things and living things and of um of our body cells so the this is you know under uh, right now um you know investigation in many areas of health because these um hydrogen atoms are replaced with the fluorine and they can carry large amounts of oxygen and carbon dioxide so like the hydrogen ions the fluorine came over and replaced the hydrogen so they fluorine you have Fluorine, fluorine there. And so this actually can make um, uh, a good substitute in breathing of air. You know, the, the perfluoron, they call it perfluoron right here, this long name. <laughs> um, and it's C8F12BR. You know, let's, let's look at the, there's a, actually a table on this here. Here we go. So, um, you can see the, oops, sorry, the pure fluoride. Sorry, I messed up here, there. In fact, let's look at that here. We can see here's the Freon. Pretty simple, you know, when you look at this, because you see the fluorine and the chlorine, chloride. Um, so the Freon, and you go on to the next and see how they put the, the, uh, the change between the, the fluorine and this one and this one with the, um, uh, carbon onto, and we have here the carbon, the PTFE that we talked about, and now the pure flow. This is the this is the plastic. See how strong that looks, 
you know, so this is the refrigerant. And onto both of these are refrigerants, and then this onto the Pura floor brawn. And um, basically, this one here, see how unusual it looks too. Um, and using um, a partial liquid ventilation to save lives of premature infants so they could actually breathe better. So if, um, if they, it's called partial liquid vent ventilation, and um, especially for premature infants whose lungs are not developed yet, so that they could um, breathe air. So saving um, babies' lives is pretty amazing. They also use it to treat, you know, the picture of it there, keep it there, to treat, um, like drowning, people near drowning, or to treat smoke in inhalation, or anyone that's in acute respiratory distress, because they can breathe this with the fluorine instead of the hydrogen. Pretty amazing. Um, it also can be used um, as a temporary blood substitute. So, because it has a longer shelf life, it actually has a lot of advantages than giving someone a blood transfusion. Because under a blood transfusion, what happens under a blood transfusion, um, you can get, um, you know, um, allergic reactions. You have to have the same blood type, you know, um, and you could have, get hepatitis and HIV positive and all these things, HIV and AIDS and everything from blood, but not through um, using this temporary blood substitute of um, perflubron. So that we're talking about this. So pretty amazing. Other uses of fluorine, um, and there's quite a few other uses of fluorine here. Um, but um, as we go over them here, basically nuclear can prepare um, uranium fuel, so that's important, and hydrogen um, fluoride um, can slowly dissolve glass, frost light bulbs, and etched glass lasers use fluorine too. Argon fluoride excimer laser is one of the top lasers, so other uses of fluorine. So uh, let's go over chlorine. Hmm. I was thinking, oh, we'll go on for a little bit. We might have to break this up because it goes on to the other, it takes a little bit, but let's talk about chlorine now. It's one of the most versatile elements um, and basically, um, sorry about this, I had to, okay. It is the most versatile elements of the periodic table. In many ways, chlorine chemistry is the foundation of much of our modern technology from computers to plastics to medicine. Chlorine is used in a lot. It's the foundation of a lot of things in our um, common day modern society. So um, leeches and disinfectants, um, are important uh, elemental, uh, elemental chlorine and oxygen compounds are used to kill germs and to break down odors. Um, hikers use chlorine tablets. Um, bleach is used in wood pulp and paper textiles to make paper. Also, bleach is used in laundry soap, right? Basically, um, to get rid of those um, bacteria, you know, so. Um, swimming pools, again, use chlorine. Household disinfectants have uh, chlorine in them. Um, household bleach, actually, we will look at household bleach as a 5% solution of sodium hypochlorite. Remember that, because you think it's a test question. So what is bleach? Sodium hypochlorite. And here's a picture, here's a symbol of sodium hypochlorite and which the active ingredient is the opal chloride ion. So the swimming pools are kept clear by the addition of chemicals that produce the hypochlorous acid in the solution. So um, th this is so important. Um, basically what happens, and there's a picture down here, I think. Here we go, this picture. And so what's, what's happening here is, um, the, 
the chlorine and the water reacting, and you see how this reacts here um, in, in, uh, um, in the midst. So we have the equation. So here we have the, the picture here. So basically you have um, the, the chlorine coming in, the, um, the o, OH chlorine coming in and replacing here. So they come and replace the Rs, whatever they may be. They may they'd be another part of the molecule. And so as they're replacing here, it forms with the hydrogen. And this is um, uh, basically coming in. And this is um, the basis for a bleaching act, act action, how it bleaches and adds to these double bonds there producing. So, so it's dissolved due to the color of the double bonds, the removal of color with the double bonds here in the midst. You see how <clears throat> this changes from this to this. And this is um, the main um, substance that we're talking about, the hypochlorite ion, the hypochlorite. So is it hydrogen um, coming on and reacting? Here we go. So just anyway, to see that picture is kind of important. Just remember it's the hypochlorous acid, you know, and that hypochlorite um, um, ion, hypochlorite ion and the hypochlorite acid in the midst to bleach. Another um, is PVC. Have you heard of PVC? Polyvinyl chloride. So PVC, I always think of PVC pipes, right? And they're made. It's one of the most important and widely used chlorine compounds is PVC. It's very durable, chemically inert, uh, plastic, kind of uh, plastic manufactured from petroleum or natural gas and rock salt. So we have this um, uh, PVC and there's a lot of things that are made from PVC, from raincoats, hoses, toys, food packaging, shower curtains, soles of the shoe, medical devices, computers, kitchen supplies, plumbing, um, synthetic leather, vinyl, credit cards, furniture, upholstery, electrical insulating, flooring, life jackets, automobiles, um, or automobile components, I should say, swimming pool liners, um, pollution contaminate barriers, and then again, um, in the midst of all this, there's actually much more. So chlorine is very important in um, plastics. And on to medicines. Most medicines either contain chlorine or are manufactured using chlorine. So if we want to get rid of chlorine, it's a big deal because um, there's a lot of medicines that we get rid of. It's estimated that as many as 85% of all of our medicines involve chlorine in some way, including decongestants, antihistamines, gastrointestinal intestinal me um, medicine, sedatives, anti-cancer drugs, antibiotics, pain relievers, antifungals, anti-inflammatory drugs, and many others. So all of our basic um, drugs for colds and flus and stomach aches and cancer and um, sleep medicine, everything, decongestants, you know, all of these have chlorine in them in some way. So another thing that chlorine is used for is crop protection. So when we think of uh, crop protection, what do you think of? You think of um, pesticides and stuff. So they protect, um, protect crops from insects and from insects and fungus and weeds to control these household pests. Uh, pests. So um, there's common insecticides that can co contain chlorine, including um, endosulfan, lindane, and chloropyphrol. So here we have pictures of them too. So um, in the midst of chlorine, and these have actually now, a lot of them have been restricted uh, because of uh, environmental control. So, but we have insecticide, this is DDT, this is 245T herbicide, it's a picture of it. Uh, PCBs, coolants and insulators in electrical equipment. So, this is a little different. These are the insecticides. And then uh, trichloroethylene here, onto the refrigerant 3M12, 
um, with chlorine in it. So, um, so these are just some of the pictures of the molecules. So, uh, <clears throat> so we talked about crop protection. So all of these things here we have, these are all have chlorine. These, these PVCs, you know, all of these things, pipes, credit cards, everything here. And here's the structure of the PVC. See how when you, whenever you have a long um, poly line of, of um, molecules here, it makes it very strong. So here's the structure of the PVC. So, and these of chlorine. So we have um, hydrogen, hydrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, and chlorine, all the way through with the carbons. So see how they unite together. Uh, banned and restricted chlorine compounds. So um, the Montreal Protocol um, banned many chlorine compounds. Um, one example was DDT, which probably needed to be banned or at least limited in some way. But DDT did save millions of lives from malaria until the United States curtailed the worldwide use, um, citing its pers uh, persistence in the environment. So basically saying we needed to um, um, ban it. But, but doing that, they had to find another way to get rid of insects, especially uh, mosquitoes, right? Um, many other banned pesticides and herbicides too were banned. Um, and we had some pictures of that, that 245T. They used that for a while. So... Another uh, group of chlorinated compounds that has been banned in recent decades was, were PCBs. So PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls right here. Since 1929, these non-flammable substances have been used extensively in transformers and capacitors on electric power lines. And because of their chemical stability, low uh, volatility and their um, ability to conduct heat, but not electricity, they were really good. They thought, oh, this, these are perfect. However, they discovered to the toxic effects on some animals and humans from PCBs um, released into the environment that led to the banning of PCBs in 1979. So starting for environmental control in the midst of um, chlorine with PCBs too. Okay, this article is very interesting about chlorine. And I'm gonna go over, uh, I'm gonna stop there. And actually, um, I still have quite a bit to do in this chapter. So we're gonna go on to the next video and we're gonna go over bromine and iodine too and then go over the questions. So, but this article is, is, is about the environment and do we need to end the use of chlorine or will ending the, use of chlorine end our whole civilization because there's so many things now that we have that have chlorine, right? So let's stop there and we'll go on to the next video.